Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, preparing to poach by Lila Burke, Inside Higher Ed, Anika and Mark will discuss why do the financial aid awards I receive vary so much from college to college in our book chapter discussion. Our question from a listener comes from Kirby in Colorado, and she wants to know, how can we avoid picking a college that will make our son turn into a jerk? Mark will be in the part three of his interview with financial expert Mark Kantrowitz on the subject of how and when should you appeal for more money if your financial aid award doesn't meet your needs. And the College Spotlight will go to Florida for the first time to look at Rollins College. Friends, we have several announcements. If you missed episode 108, had a couple big announcements on there. Anika shared why after being my co-host for 105 straight episodes, not missing during Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, rain, sleet, snow, never. She was absent for 106 through 108 and her mom's health is failing, and so she's going to have to travel a lot out of state. So we want to continue to support her with our thoughts and our prayers. And Anika also rolled out in that episode a new format, and this is the first week of our new format. So it'll start out with uh, Dave doing our In the News section, and then we'll have Anika do the book chapters uh, discussion, as well as Anika, do, Anika doing the question from our listener. I'll have my standard interview. And then Dave will return for the college spotlight. So you're going to get a mom and a dad, and we think you're going to like it. So this is uh, episode number one of our new version. Another announcement, we have had so many requests for me to do a deep dive on how the UCs do holistic admissions and how they read a file. And so I was waiting to see what was going on with the um, standardized test case out there. But now that I think I know the direction that's going, I am going to roll that out. So on episode 120, I'll be doing a deep dive on how the UCs read a file because it's very, very different than you see with um, other forms of file reading. And there's so many applications in the country that these nine UC schools get that is very important that uh, we all understand that. Also, another announcement, the personal statements for the CASA 2021 are out. So the same seven personal statements for the common application that were in effect the last few years have not changed again, and that means students can get started. For our admissions tip of the week, now this is going to kind of so coincide with what Dave and I are about to talk about in a few seconds here, but if money's a major factor for you, if you're someone who has one school you're likely to commit to, but another school that if they were to give you an extra 5000 10 or 15,000, they would probably flip your decision. I really want to encourage you this year because some changes that are in effect, not to refuse their acceptance offer. It's going to be in your best interest to just kind of leave it hanging out there until you know for sure that you want to go to school X because of these changes. And Dave and I are about to discuss them. There are going to be certain schools that are going to be aggressively coming after you if you do not commit to them. And so it's just something to keep in mind. And for our admissions vernacular, the word of the day is comprehensive review. Any idea what that is, Dave? Well, I'm guessing it has to do with comprehensively reviewing something. <laughs> now, you're, now you are proving that you are the male version of Anika. That's now right. you're also proving that you listen to all of our episodes. Because that's a tactic she would use. Just quote the word right back at me. That's right. Nice one. <laughs> nice one. So comprehensive review really is just a euphemism for a holistic review. Mm. It's a it's a method of reading an application that goes beyond looking just at test scores and grades and courses. And so, you know, it takes various forms, whether we're talking about extracurriculars, recommendations, essay writing, demonstrated interest, institutional priorities, grade trends, interviews, all of those things. But the bottom line is it's the same thing as holistic review. And it's actually a term you'll hear the UCs use a lot. Comprehensive review. 
Take it away, Dave. What do we got for our news article then? Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Well, what we have today is a very interesting article. It's called Preparing to Poach. And uh, first of all, I always get confused on the acronyms. So we are going to describe, first of all, NACAC. And NACAC stands for the National Association for College Admission Counseling. And what this article talks about is that this organization, which has long been responsible for governing how colleges compete with one another for students, has now opened the doors for colleges to aggressively recruit from other colleges, students, even after they've committed to a particular college. Now, this is the result of an antitrust lawsuit from the Department of Justice last year. And because of this lawsuit, the association struck from its code provisions that ban colleges from poaching students from another institution. And it's just rolling out this year, so the actual impact is not quite known. But an educational consulting firm called EAB said that the impact could be quite significant because uh, up to 35% of some college counselors or colleges may consider trying to incentivize students that they've already admitted but may have chosen another school to reconsider them by sweetening the pot with giving better financial aid packages and so forth and get those students to switch over to their school during that summer period while they still haven't yet shown up on campus. So let me stop there and ask Mark if that was an adequate summary of the chapter of the Yeah, that was that was pretty good. So let me let me just add a couple things to what you said. So, you know, as you mentioned, you know, NACAC serves as a regulatory body to make sure that all the colleges are functioning like by the best principles of good practice. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, what happens if you violate, you know, one of the ethics? Well, they have some teeth because NACAC also sponsors these huge 20 college fairs that go all around the country and you can be banned from being in one of those fairs and they get a lot of applications from these fairs. I mean, these are the huge, huge, huge college fairs and they've got some other tools in their toolkit as well as publicly shaming you you know, in front of the membership. So there's some teeth in their enforcement. But what happened this year, this is Department of Justice, we did a whole podcast on this, was about to basically strip NACAC of all of their their rights if they didn't make some changes. And they felt like students should have the ability to go wherever they want. They should not be bound to have to go to certain schools the way NACAC was enforcing them. And so, first of all, let me start by just reading, just in case people missed that episode, because it was really important one of our biggest breaking news is that we've ever done was this announcement. So let me go over what those changes were because they're so significant. So colleges must not offer incentives exclusive to students applying or admitted under an early decision application. So this was something in the past. Colleges were not allowed to do that. So if you wanted to entice somebody by early decision, you couldn't say, here's a special financial package or here's a special housing arrangement or Here's a special scholarship for you coming in as an early decision admit. And so that was not something that colleges were permitted to do. And basically, in the new guidelines, that had to be stripped. And so what this article is going to go on to do is to reveal the survey research that EAB did to indicate, well, how many people are planning on doing these things? So that was the first thing. Second thing, college choices should be informed, well-considered, free from coercions, student must have a reasonable amount of time to complete the application process. And once they committed to a college, other colleges have to respect that decision. This is the key and cease recruiting them. Okay. And so that was a basic policy. It was an agreement. We all, not we, I'm talking like mission officer, colleges had amongst each other to respect a decision that another student had made. And May 1st, which is often called National Candidate Reply Day, sometimes called Decision Day, That was the day, and colleges would not be able to recruit other students who had enrolled after May 1st as part of respecting their process. That has been stripped. And then finally, colleges must not solicit transfer applications from a previous year's applicant pool. So in other words, 
you recruited somebody, you admitted them, they didn't come to your school, they went somewhere else. You couldn't start mailing them, incentivizing them, throwing scholarships at them as when they're freshmen, trying to get them to come to your school. That was taboo. That was prohibited. All those things were stripped. So we did an In the News. Dave, do you remember when we did uh, In the News on this topic? Yes, you it did. Was called yeah. Something, yeah, it was something like uh, it's the Wild Wild West, it was called. Yes, and you were actually quite uh, dramatic, saying that you thought this was going to have a huge impact going forward. You just weren't sure about the size of the impact. But yes, I do remember that uh, in the news. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, I was having a conversation with the highly selective school. You know, the highly selective schools, I mentioned highly selective because they're the ones with the, you know, when they have that prestige, you would think that they are not in danger of losing kids. But uh, this is a very senior admission officer. He said, Mark, we're concerned. He said, a lot of kids are not happy their first couple weeks of school. There's so many adjustments going on as a freshman. And are other schools who are also reputable going to start targeting our freshmen with special scholarships, trying to get them to come to us and getting them at a point where they're vulnerable? You know, and this could be total chaos. And so what this article today that Dave described talks about is this survey that was done by EAB, as Dave mentioned, an educational consulting firm. And what EAB did is... They had 159 enrollment officers who responded to their survey, and their survey was done in mid-October. So it was only a few weeks after NACAC officially changed its guidelines. And basically what the survey did is participants were given a long list of practices, and they were asked to select whether they would be considered using any of these practices in their recruitment this year. And so the results came back, and they, at least initially, they are affirming the fact that, yeah, it looks like it could be the wild, wild west. For example, one of the highlights from the survey, 54% of very small colleges said that they are likely to start uh, recruiting rising freshmen who have committed elsewhere. In other words, we know they've already committed elsewhere, but we're not going to stop recruiting them. 54%. Wow. A couple of questions for you, Dave. One, is that higher number than you thought? And any idea why the number was the most highest or was the highest with small colleges? Well, no, because I'm putting it in the context that colleges are struggling for students. And we had already talked about the fact that 25% of colleges could be out of business in the next decade or so because of the declining enrollment. And we also know that it's differentially impacting smaller schools. So every student represents a lifeline to fiscal solvency for many of these schools. So it's like, this is their lifeline. So uh, if I was a small school, I'd be fighting for every single student I, I can. So no, both in, in light of that, the figure seems reasonable. And, and I can see why it, it's impacting small colleges the, more than the larger, more established, more well-funded institutions. Yeah, exactly. Very apropos what you said here. And here's a quote from the article. It's from Joyce Smith, who is the CEO of NACAC. And so Joyce Messiovanak said that she and others are very concerned about what might be in store for college admissions this summer and fall. Uncertainty around whether students will show up in September, she said, means uncertainty around financial aid budgets and housing. When any and all of this is on shaky ground, it's not just the admission office that is concerned. And that's, you know, the overwhelming majority of schools are completely tuition driven. Tuition makes up for the majority of schools over 90%, definitely over 85% of their operating budget. So no tuition, no job for staff, for faculty, for administration, you know, no tuition, no school or no tuition, closing programs, closing majors, stopping all of your big projects and all kinds of things happen when you don't have the money. And so when you're fighting for survival, and especially for schools that are under-enrolled and don't hit their number. Because quite honestly, there are a lot of fixed costs to run a college, you know, anyway. You make your financial commitments to staff and administration, which is your biggest cost. But then just even other things like all your electrical and your heating and all of those bills, those are like fixed costs. So the actual cost itself to add another student doesn't really add as much as you may think to your total cost. Does that make sense, Dave? No, it makes total sense. Yes, absolutely. It's kind of like a golf course. Like to build a golf course, 
there's a lot of expenses. You got the land, you got the maintenance of the land and all that. But to actually have another a player go out and play a round of golf doesn't really cost you that much. Right. I mean, what are they going to do? Put a couple of divots in a bunker? You know, I mean, the actual cost is not. Now, that's even more extreme of an example, because, you know, you're going to have food costs and things like that. Advisor cost. I mean, you're working with students. I'm not saying there's no cost. But the point is, when students, when schools are under enrolled, they can get really, really aggressive because their actual cost to add a body is not that much. So then they start throwing scholarships at students. And, you know, another thing about this article that that I thought was interesting, Dave, was while it was true that it was most evident with your really small schools, you know, the results were pretty striking, even for all schools, you know, and now. There's been some pushback to the article. Some people feel like, hey, the sample size, you know, wasn't as large as it could be. But uh, one of the people involved in the research, he's pushed back as well. And he said, look, 45% of the respondents were from suburban colleges. 40% were from urban colleges. 15% were from rural colleges. So we think it was quite representative of what we can expect. And one thing that EAB is planning on doing is they are planning on doing another survey, a follow-up survey in April, and to just gauge again how many people are still looking at implementing these practices. So what are your thoughts, Dave? Well, you know, it it reminds me of an article I read a a couple of years back about how University of Chicago was aggressively expanding its undergraduate enrollment. And I think over the last 10, 15 years, it's almost doubled. And one of the reasons was because it totally improved its financial resources. Uh, If you're paying $50,000 in tuition, room and board, well, that means every 10 students is another million dollars. Every 10 students, another half a million. Every 20 students is another million dollars. You can see how getting just a couple hundred extra students can really make the difference in balancing those budgets. And this was definitely one of the reasons why University of Chicago aggressively expanded its undergraduate enrollment, and it enabled it to generate enough revenue to do a lot of the campus improvements that was also related to its rise in the rankings. Well, you know, a test case for this is the University yeah. of Alabama. Yeah. They have leveraged their football success like nobody else has ever done that I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Not only are they 60% out of state, so that's triple tuition. They've added more than 3,000 students to the student body, right. you know? And so when you see a coach getting $9 million, you know, you wonder, well, you can see how much money is he, are you bringing into the institution? Yeah. But one thing I wanted to comment about in the article is, so are there any positives that are going to come out of this? Because, you know, like you said, I was like four alarm fire. Like I, this concerned me when this whole change was made, right? Well, I, I think a positive is it's it's a positive for the students. You know, so much of what we've seen has uh, been to the advantage of the institution when we talk about early action. Now, if I'm a student and I get admitted to an institution and then all of a sudden another institution says, ah, hey, reconsider me because I'll sweeten your aid package or I'll make it a little easier to do X, Y, and Z. Well, Anytime you are the one being recruited, whether you're an athlete or a student, I think some benefits accrue to you because you can actually compare the benefits, the packages that the two institutions give you. So I I see it as a way of just shifting the balance of uh, power a little bit back on the student end from the institution. And that's actually a good point. Actually, it's a point John Bakkenstadt makes as well. This is the reason why it was actually done probably because I did admissions and because I'm expecting total chaos and I know how much pressure schools are under for budgets. I, I don't lean like I, I'm not a fan of this, but I do see that side of it. And I think it's important that that side's articulated. But here's one thing that I do see as a positive. It's going to force colleges to have to up their game when it comes to making the freshman experience really positive so that people don't want to transfer. So schools are going to have to put more resources into advising and into course selection and getting people in the right dorm setting, the right courses, the right roommate situations. You know, if they're contentious, resources are going to have to be spent there. These are all the kinds of things that make students, you know, transfer. And so I like the fact that it will force schools to have to up their game at providing a positive experience for the students so that they don't lose them. 
Now, I'll tell you a negative consequences that I do see coming out of this besides I also think just people getting up and leaving as soon as you have a problem is not a good life skill because that can carry over into things like marriage and things like jobs. As soon as things get tough, you just pick up and go and take your ball home. So I am concerned about that. But one negative I also see with this, Dave, is one way colleges are going to fight back, and it's obvious this is going to happen, is they're going to increase the amount of deposit that deposits people have to make on the front end. So if a school, let's say in the past, required a $200 deposit to confirm your spot, you know, they may make that a thousand or two thousand dollar deposit. So there's less of an incentive for someone just to pick up and lose because they would lose their money. Any thoughts? Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if I'm the one who's going to be losing out on a fifty thousand dollar tuition, I'm going to make sure that uh, before I give away that spot, you've got a little skin in the game. So I don't think that's totally unreasonable. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that perspective up of there's some leveling of the playing field. Colleges have all the power because. You know, because I did admissions, I do sometimes see things through the prism of just how difficult this will make your job. And so I see things that way. But there is another side of it. And I think, you know, you're coming in it probably purely just from like the student doesn't really care about how hard it makes your job. I just care about what's best for me, you know, and and if you give me a better offer, then I want to hear it. So anyway, I think I think we've talked about this enough, but this is something it's such a big story that we'll obviously be revisiting this again and following it. Like this is just a survey right now, but what about when we have real evidence of how many people actually left after they were enrolled and how many people, how many transfer do transfers go up now because colleges target people they admitted the year before and go after them with aggressive packages. You know, this is something we, we want to come back to with and we actually have hard data of the real experience, not just survey data, but I think it's a huge, huge, huge story in, in college admissions. And in fact, since we've been doing our podcast, uh, Dave, we're into year three. You had to tell me what are the biggest stories in college admissions um, in terms of how they'll impact admissions. Obviously, the Rick Singer story was a huge national story, right? I would put this and the changes to the ACT as the two biggest stories that I see changing college admissions. And that makes sense. I mean, we have talked many times that there's a coming bloodbath. Uh, with the colleges, and it's going to be a survival of the fittest. In fact, I believe in one of your episodes, which was very enlightening, you talked about an article about the four ways that colleges can prepare, uh, whether they need to consolidate, maybe join up with other colleges, whether they need to focus on certain specialties or majors, but that the reality is, is that, as we said many times, you know, in 10, 15 years, one quarter of the colleges may not be here or may be changed in one way or another. And the big thing they're going to fight over is students. So this is probably the beginning of a trend of a very, very aggressive recruiting and fighting over the resources that's going to be necessary to keep these institutions in business. So you're right. Yeah. And, and let me just say something in that because it's such an important point and that's such a huge macro trend, the impact it's going to have on higher ed. It's more than just the fact that you have a declining college going population. It's the decreased value that people are ascribing to college right now. You know, when, when you see 41% of young people think higher education is a good value for their money and not too long ago, that number's in the seventies, you got a problem. And then you have all of the other factors like the declining international population. And then you have the competitive alternatives like the growth of online, the growth of badges and certificate programs. So it's like the confluence of all of these things all at one that make it like a, you know, as I said, a four car, what's that term, a four car alarm or something like that? Yeah, four, four alarm fire. <laughs> four alarm fire. Yeah. Four alarm yeah, fire. Four, four, I was going to say a five on the hurricane. What's that? The hurricanes get ranked one through five, right? <laughs> yeah, so category five. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little off, a little shaky. See, this, see, friends, Dave is like an Anika. He's a morning guy. He wants to be recording this at 7 a.m. I, wow. I don't get going at 7 a.m. I'm like the total night owl. So, <laughs> I'm on, But hey, it's all good. It's all good. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are in episode 109, and you know that means book chapter 109. 
And this is actually a really important chapter, important discussion. And so what we're looking at today is why are my financial aid awards all over the place? In other words, if I get in five schools and I apply for financial aid, why is it that one school is asking me to pay 45, 125, 165, 110, 150, you know, that's what we're diving in today. And so, Anika, you've uh, read the chapter. It's a long chapter. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> they're all over the place because it is a long chapter. <laughs> but, I know, it's long. <laughs> long by my standards. <laughs> right, right, right. But I'm gonna Get four or five pages, maybe. Here's what I want to do, though. I kind of want to take, so I want to start with a few points. Okay. In the first part of your chapter, so you're listing out some key reasons on why they're different. Mm -hmm. And I know you probably want to touch on all of them, but I'm going to tell you the ones that I jumped on first. Okay, so here's an apparent reason. Well, I shouldn't say apparent, but here's the first reason that you list in here. And you Mm -hmm. say that some schools gap and some don't. But we talk about, and this, when you talk about gapping, you're talking about meeting the need full on, right? Is that the same thing? Yeah, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because there's a lot of content here. But Mm -hmm. basically, a school that doesn't gap will meet the what we call the full calculated need of a family. So it takes the expected family contribution. It comes back. And remember the basic formula, cost of attendance, minus expected family contribution mm-hmm. equals your need. And it will give you your need. Okay, now it will do it. Remember, financial aid is grants, loans, and work study. So it will do it through a combination of free money, grant scholarship, work study, and loans. But whatever that need is, it will meet it. But that's not what most schools do. Right. So if it comes back and it says your expected family contribution is 30000 schools, they gap may ask you to pay 40000 And the gap is the difference between the 40 and the 30. So they mm-hmm. gap to you, they ask you to pay 10000 more. That's right. extremely. And so because some schools gap and some don't gap, that's one reason why eight awards are different. Okay. So now the next one is the FSCOG grant. I think this is a grant. Correct. And Is it correct that not a lot of schools offer this or that there are just a decent amount of schools that offer the FSCOG? A decent amount do. But the point is some schools have FSCOG and some don't. Okay. We're going to talk about that in Chapter 119, so I don't want to go too much more into it. But for now, let's just say some offer it and some don't. And so that's one reason alone why your rate awards can be different. Okay. Now, on the third point, you say some colleges meet the remaining need you know, where it's cost of attendance minus expected family contribution equals the actual financial need of the family. But how is that different from gapping, though? Great, because because if you read that whole point, I say, if you take out the parenthesis, Anika, some mm-hmm. colleges meet the remaining need with loans. That's the key point. Some, okay. some colleges meet it with loans and some without gotcha, loans. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. So in gotcha. other words, some schools use loans to meet your need, mm-hmm. and there are about 20 of the richest schools in the country one of the hardest to get in also, that meet your need only with what we call gift aid, meaning grants and scholarships. I mean, maybe work study, but not with loans. Okay. So that's, that's, that can cause your package to differ, right? That, right, that, right, that right. Can, yeah, because if there's loans versus not loans, that's the reason why, you know, you can get a different aid award from one school to the next. Okay. Now, the next one is pretty straightforward because merit scholarships vary from school to school. Like, you know, Correct. people offer you different amounts of money. Yeah, and that's actually very similar to the next point, too. Yeah, I was just about to say, the segue into the next one about where you talk about preferential packaging where schools will give you money because they want you more. Like, oh, I really want this kid, so I'm going to give them more money. Yeah, so and, and what it is, it's, it's the com- it's the gift, it's the mix, right? So if you look mm-hmm. at the fact that financial aid is a combination of grants and scholarships, loans and work study, schools that want you more, one, they may not get, but also they may give you a better combination, more grants, more scholarships, less loans. It's called mm-hmm. preferential packaging. So that's why, so for one school, they really want you, so they give you tons of scholarship and grant money, but another school, maybe that you barely squeaked in, so they fill you up more with loans. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Now, the next one, I, I think it's pretty straightforward too, is that the cost of attendance varies from school to school. Exactly. So so let's say, let's say you're a family um, and you qualify, you know, your expected family contribution is 30000 Okay, and you apply to a school that's it's like twenty one thousand dollars for everything, an in state mm-hmm. school, maybe a public school. Then obviously, you know, the cost is going to be lower because versus a school that's let's say fifty five thousand. So it's pretty straightforward. The fact that the costs vary means your aid award oftentimes will vary. 
Okay. Now, this final point you have in here is kind of like going into the next section of this chapter. Correct. And you're making the point that there's a very big difference between how the FAFSA and the profile impact your aid award. Correct. Exactly. And any thoughts at all on this chapter? And it could be, but you just want to dive into the different points. Well, I know that the profile is not at, you know, or at more selective schools, which is the same as the synonymous with the CSS profile. Is that right? Correct. And also, you know, that's what we talked about the profile in episode 108 the last week. So hopefully our listeners, you know, what I'll say, listeners, if you haven't heard last week's back book chapter discussion, you really want to hear that. I talked about what the profile is last week. Now it's the application to the, of the profile to your actual aid award here. Mm-hmm. Correct. It is the CSS profile. You know, it is offered by almost all private schools, usually wealthier private schools, and it's their own institutional money uh-huh. that we're talking about here where FAFSA is federal money. Okay. So now we're going to go into the ways that they're different. Okay. We're talking about- Correct. And, and that would mean the profile versus mm-hmm. the FAFSA. Mm-hmm. Correct. And so the first one is that the non-custodial spouse is factored into the profile for 80%. You said 80% of profile schools. Why 80%? Yeah. So, okay. So first of all, let me explain what this is. So- this is only going to apply in cases where two parents are not living in the same household. Okay. If you have a case, separation, divorce, never married, single parent, anything like that, FAFSA school only asks for the financial information for the parent you're living with. That's all they ask for. Okay. The profile, the majority of the time, about 80% of the time, will also require the non custodial spouse or parent, mm-hmm. other parent, the other parent, I should say the other parents, it could be a never married situation. Mm-hmm. They will also require that person's financial information. Mm-hmm. The reason why it's 80% is there are some schools that just don't necessarily agree with that. Mm-hmm. That's an individual s- decision that an individual school makes. Okay. Do we want to require, but the majority of the time they will, because a lot of times that's a lot of money that somebody can hide. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. can live with the mom who makes 60 and then the dad makes 260. And the schools want access to that and they feel like that other parent should play a role and pay for college. So you think, are you suggesting that the wealthier schools who like the Yales or whoever, who's got the billion trillion dollar endowments are the ones that aren't worried about the other parent or is it just? No, that's a great question. So what you're asking is, is it the wealthiest of the wealthy that say, no, we don't need the other parent? Mm -hmm. No, no. Those schools feel like both parents should pay their fair share. Hmm. There's just certain schools that. You know, sometimes it, it's really can be very, very difficult sometimes tracking down that other parent. Right. You have to deal with all kinds of situations. Like sometimes people don't even know where that parent is or they could be incarcerated, could be out of the country. And some schools just say it's just more of a headache, more of a headache than it's worth Okay, tracking that down because it leads to all kinds of appeals and it really can elongate and protract the process. And some schools say just they just. Some schools just agree with the FAFSA methodology of we think the person you live with is the only one that we feel should have to contribute. Okay. All right. So but that's not the norm. That's not the norm. Gotcha. Okay. So now the mm-hmm. second point is about home equity policy. And it, if I think I'm reading this correctly where the FAFSA doesn't consider or doesn't have a home equity policy where profile does. Is that right? Not exactly. Close. This is an extremely important one, by the way, that can explain why eight awards can vary. What the FAFSA does is is it does not take into consideration the primary residence in which you live when it's generating your expected family contribution or when it's coming up with how much they feel you should be able to pay. So you literally could live in a $20 million house as your primary residence, and it would not increase what the school is going to tell you you have to pay. So FAFSA formula exempts the value of your home in the calculations. Okay. The profile formula is all over the place. And there's so many different policies when it comes to home equity, but there are very, very, very few schools of the 187 profile schools, very few that do not factor home equity. in. Like you can count them on two hands in the whole country. Okay. But just because a school looks at home equity, what is their policy? There are schools that count all of home equity and there are schools that count none. And then most are in between. And just to put this in perspective, If a family has $500,000 in home equity and a school is counting all of that into the formula, then they're going to ask you to pay another $28,000 per year. Mm -hmm. If a school is counting none of your home equity, then they would take none of that $500,000. So you see how home equity policy 
really can explain why eight awards vary. And once again, most people are not at both of those extremes. It's rare for a school to count all of it, and it's rare for a school to count none of it. What's most common are a bunch of policies in between, and we'll get into the weeds if we start going there. I want to get into it because you know I'm a geek and a nerd. <laughs> I feel it I'm boiling in your blood, Mark. I'm moving on to I'm the next trying, point. <laughs> I'm trying hard to keep our podcast under two hours. <laughs> okay, okay. Next one, next one, next one. Forget about it, forget about it. All right, so we've got remarriage situations where some schools will require and factor into their EFC step parents. Yeah, so so the most common thing in remarriage situations is that the remarried parents has to share all of their income. Um, just and they're treated just like the biological parent. Mm-hmm. But some schools have different policies on remarriage parent situations. Okay. Some of them don't ask the remarried parent to pay at the same portion of their income as the biological parent. Hmm. Some are more open to appeals and and some of them, this is very rare, but there are a few schools that expect the remarried parent, the current biological parent, and the former parent, all three to contribute. Ooh. So there's just, that's rare. So the point is how schools handle remarriage and the amount of money that the remarried parent has to pay, there are variations in policies okay. and also variations in how open schools are to appeals. Because okay. sometimes a remarried parent says, hey, this isn't my kid. Like, I'll pay some, but I'm not paying all that amount of my money. And some schools are a little more sensitive to that. They can work with people in that. And some are like, sorry, they just go by the books and they treat the remarried exactly like the married, Hmm. like the biological. Okay. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. All right, next one is summer earnings. And let me be clear on this one. So you're saying that the summer earnings are considered, whether they're factored in or not, and it says a $500 expectation or a $3,500 expectation. I probably didn't read the right part of that correctly. Yeah. So this is something the FAFSA doesn't expect the student to make money over the summer that goes toward your college tuition, room and board, other expenses. FAFSA formula doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. The profile does. You know, there are a few schools I can think of that exempt students from making a summer contribution, Mm -hmm. but it's very rare. Mm -hmm. And so once a school decides, okay, we think a student should work over the summer, you're able-bodied, you're 18, you're 20, you're 22. We think you should work, and we think a portion of your earnings should go to us. Now, their policies are all over the place in terms of how much they expect you to make and contribute. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So I see numbers as low as zero, and I see numbers up to around 3,500 and everything in between. Okay. And so once again, the context that we're talking about is why is one package totally different than another? Mm-hmm. And you see all you see all the different reasons we're listing here. Right, right. So the outs- the next one is that the outside scholarship policies vary widely. They vary, basically. Yeah, and I don't want to talk too much about this because this, ep- this is chapter 130 in the book. Oh, yeah. But basically, when you get an outside scholarship from a church, from a corporation, from a civic organization, from a foundation, from a philanthropist, different schools have different policies on how that's handled. Some schools say, okay, you have additional money coming in. And therefore, we're going to reduce the amount of money we're going to give you in terms of our free money 
because you're wealthier than we thought. Mm-hmm. And then other schools say, no, you went, you got that on your own. That's completely up to you. And then there are lots of differences in between. And that's all I want to say in this now, because that's, I won't have anything to say when we get to one thirty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next one. Schools that use the FAFSA rely on AGI, but profile schools look at business losses, rental property losses, and real estate losses. Yeah. So in turn, once again, what is the main number that FAFSA schools are using? AGI, adjusted gross income, mm. line 37, line 38, and your federal 1040 tax return. But it's much more of a complex assessment that is done to look at your income. Now, you know, there are some other things like there are untaxed income that still can factor in, but there's a lot more complexity in how profile schools look at your actual income. Okay. All right. Now, the next one is the college's K through 12 tuition paying policy. Now, I'm assuming this means that you got brothers and sisters in exactly. third grade. Are you paying for them to go to school? And how does the profile Correct. treat that? And how does FAFSA treat that? Correct. Okay. So FAFSA doesn't look at it at all. Okay. It's a non-factor and it's not going to reduce your expected family contribution. There are a few schools that can come up with their own policy on that that accept the FAFSA, but that's extremely rare. And for profile schools, it's all over the place how they treat it. But what I've never seen anybody do is say, okay, you got another kid at, at a boarding school and you're paying 60000 so we'll take $60,000 of after-tax money and factor that into the calculations. What I see, and this is the kind of things I talk to schools about, I see anywhere from zero to 12000 is what a school will use as a number. So they won't necessarily look and say, okay, you're paying 30000 so we'll reduce 30000 off of your... Uh, adjusted gross income or, you know, for our calculations, Mm -hmm. they don't look at it that way. They have their own number and that, and they assign their own number. And normally if a school does this at all, it's between six and 12. Okay. But the point is, I think people are seeing, let's just stop for a second. I think people are seeing how many different factors play a role in how a school assesses what you can pay and why this explains that You know, once again, if you're not applying for financial aid, this is completely irrelevant. But if you are, these are all the reasons why schools are not asking you to pay the same amount. Right, right. And we got a few more to go. (laughs) We do. (laughs) We do. But quick, quick, quick. So, okay. So the next one is tell us how profile versus FAFSA in business income. This is a big deal. So you remember before how I said that your primary residence it could be a $10 million house. Mm-hmm. The FAFSA doesn't count yeah. a penny of it yeah. toward your EFC. Mm-hmm. Well, the FAFSA does the same thing if you own a business that has less than 100 employees and the family owns 50% or more of the business. Okay. So you could have a really booming business with 90 employees and you could own you know, 100% of it and the FAFSA will not look at that business income. And the profile says, absolutely, we're counting that income. That's money you have that the other person doesn't have. And they're going to make you submit crazy documents related to that to assess what you can really pay. Okay. And you don't have a business, and David's in his one. So I had to, I got, yeah, oh, I, I hate it. You it. That I stuff. remember you talking about how oh, you I hate it. it. <laughs> the darn thing will take me five hours to do sometimes. All right, businessman. Sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> next one, farm income, you know, similar to business, I think. Correct. And this is one thing that can really upset a lot of people that own a farm because the profile is going to look at the value of the farm and factor that in. A lot of people feel like just because I own a farm, it doesn't mean I can tap that money. All right. So this is kind of a controversial one, but it is a reality. FAFSA doesn't look at family farm income, but profile does. Okay. And then the next one says, how are gifts from a relative factored into EFC? And the policies vary. Correct. So there's a question. Did you see, did you receive money from a relative or a friend even on the profile? And how you answer that determines better the school's policy on that vary from one to another. Wait, now is there a threshold for that? Because I mean, if I get a twenty dollar gift for graduation, high school graduation, I'm sure they don't care about that. Are they talking about they don't? They leave it open when they ask you that. They don't, mm-hmm. you know, they, they don't say it needs to be over 5000 or 3000 They leave it open. Mm-hmm. But nobody's sweating over your $20 bill there. You can't even barely get lunch off that these days. Well, but even, but I guess my point is that what are they considering? Like, even if I decided to tell them that, are they still saying, oh, you got some money? Like, regardless of the amount. So 
here's the thing. Assets, that's considered an asset, not income. I don't want to get too technical, but there is something called an asset protection allowance. So unless your assets get up to a certain amount, then none of it counts. Okay. And so if you're under what's called the asset protection allowance, then even if you have a gift, which is like considered like money in the bank, mm-hmm. then it won't matter at all. Okay. And if you're above that threshold, just a little bit more than 5% counts. So still not that much, so, you know? Okay. So it's a... It's, but they ask it in case it's significant. Yeah, oh, geez. Come on, profile. All right. So um, <laughs> does a college. Hey, <laughs> this is their precious hard earned money. I know. And they're trying to make, they've worked right. like sometimes centuries to build up these endowments. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to make sure that it goes to the people that truly qualify. Really, what their profile's done, just to be blunt about it, they have basically made all your financial forms bulletproof when it comes from hiding money. Okay. That's what they've done. They've bulletproofed the whole system. Every imaginable trick that an accountant could come up with to hide money, they've blocked it. <laughs> they have. I'm serious. That's why the darn thing is over 200 questions on it. Oh, good for y'all. Okay. All right. So next one is, does a college factor in the cost of living adjustment between FAFSA and Profile? Yeah. So, so once again, FAFSA does not look at cost of living at all, which is a joke. Profile can look at cost of living. Can or cannot, once again, with profiles of smarter sports, a pick and choose situation. It's up to each individual school. They call this higher cost areas. And a college has the ability to say that Santa Barbara is a lot more expensive than Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm. And we are going to factor that in. Okay. Yeah. COLA, cost of living adjustment. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. The next one is the differences in how colleges handle various concerns around special circumstances. Like reduced rate Correct. wages, high medical costs, elderly care, et cetera. Correct. So the FAFSA doesn't even have a special circumstance section at all on it, mm-hmm. where the profile does. And it basically it says if you feel like you have an extenuating circumstance that you were unable to articulate by the questions we asked, here's your blank space to tell us about it. Okay. And then it's case by case on what the policy of each school is in terms of how they handle that. A classic case is the person that has reduced wages, Mm -hmm. you know, because remember you're using, so for 2021, a student starting 2021, you're going to be using 2019 tax returns. Right. Okay. But you're not living off 2019 income anymore. You're living off 2021 income or 2020 income. So some schools you can appeal and you can say my income went down. I had a great year in 2019. I got a huge bonus. I don't normally get that. And there's some schools that will make an adjustment. They'll ask you to produce your 2020 tax returns, maybe a 2021 W-2, and they can make an adjustment. And then other schools will be like, sorry, you're not going to come and tell us when your income goes up. You only tell us when it goes down. So it is what it is. So that policy is very Okay. So we're on the final one. And this is around child tax credits. Yeah. The, the profile just has a lot of different types of credits that they can take into consideration mm-hmm. and handle differently. One is child tax credits, earned income credits, social security benefits. There's just a number of different complexities, foreign income exclusions. There's just a number of different unique circumstances that sometimes happen that the profile can look at in the the FAFSA. The FAFSA is kind of like vanilla ice cream and the the profile, like all the works. (laughs) That's a bad example. I think it's something better than that. It it was bad, Mark. It was bad. (laughs) It's like a car with all the gadgets versus like a... Like a plain old Honda Civic. Well, it seems, but it seems to me that FAFSA is favorable, except for the cost of living thing. Not necessarily, because remember, kid in a K twelve private school. That's yeah. something that that a FAFSA look at. There are a number of things that are more favorable to FAFSA. There's no question. Mm-hmm. Some of them are can be substantial, substantial, like an income from another parent that's you know that's completely hidden. Right. You know. And so these are just the reasons why, you know, I just want people to understand if all these schools are trying to assess, you know, have me fill out these forms, why is it they're all coming back and saying I need to pay a different amount? Hmm. I just want our listeners to kind of get it. And did anything, what did you learn, Anika? I learned that I better be sticking with schools with FAFSA. <laughs> well, you didn't do that. <laughs> well, I got, that was that. one David, kid. I'm talking about the other David two. is a profile school. <laughs> John, so the, John, the bigger John. difference has to do not just with that. It also has to do with 
whole thing about gapping, right? That's yeah. more important than this, to be really honest, in most cases. Right. Does this school meet your financial need? Does it not? What are the merit scholarship policies? There are so many other factors. So you can't just say like a FAFSA school is going to ask you to pay less than a profile school. Mm-hmm. What's actually more important are things like, you know, does the school gap? Does it not gap? And what type of merit scholarships do they offer? And do they give you preferential packaging? So those are mm-hmm. some of the things that affect this more than right. anyway, I'm moneyed out. I'm profiled out. We did the, we did the profile last week, this week, like I'm done. Moving on. I can't talk about this anymore. Moving on, moving on. Moving on. Up. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. This week's question comes from Mr. Kirby. I'm loving all these dads in these past few weeks. Oh, Kirby's a mom. Oh, sorry, Kirby. (laughs) (laughs) Mom. I love the moms. I'm a mom, obviously. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that was a that was a good cleanup. Talk about covering your tracks. Okay, Kirby from Colorado. Mom, Kirby from Colorado. Her question is: I see a lot of jerks when I walk around colleges on campus visits. How do you know if a college is going to turn your child into a jerk? (laughs) Isn't isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. That's a great question. So what's the answer? So first of all, I have to give a little bit of full candor, full discussion here. So Kirby is somebody I'm working with, okay? okay? And sometimes when I work with people and I'm in a Zoom video session and they ask me a really good question, I say, oh, my goodness, that's a good question. Do you mind if we get it on the podcast? (laughs) And this was one of them. So this was one that a listener didn't send in. I just, Kirby asked it. That's how I know Kirby's a mom. And so that's where this one comes from. So first of all, this is what I'll say. There are no guarantees, okay? This is what can make parenting scary a little bit. And a brief story. So in this is, you might remember this, Annie, because I put this in my book. I'll never forget this. But when my parents dropped me off at college on my first day, and I'm very independent. I went to boarding camps my whole life from age 7 to 17. So I'm like, hey, love you, mom, dad. See ya. Kiss. Bye. You know, I hear a knock on my door like 30 minutes later, you know, and it's like my dad and he, and he has light bulbs. He's like, son, I just thought you might need some light bulbs. So I went around the corner store to get you some light bulbs. And he had like a tear rolling down his eye because his sister, my Aunt Kay, her only son, he got picked up by a cult, children of God, and they never ever saw him for like decades. Oh, wow. So he was like scared to death to just leave me alone knowing he was letting me go out into the world. So I just say, you know, parenting is scary. Letting go is scary. And there's not going to be anything that's perfect. But what we're trying to do with our kids is give them roots and wings. It's all about roots and wings. We're trying to give them foundational, deep root roots, like a tree that's 200 years old with those roots that go deep into the ground. And then we're trying to give them skills so that they can just soar when they get out there. And so it starts at home. It starts with, you know, it starts with that foundation that we lay for them. And most of it is our modeling. You know, they watch and observe how we act, and they'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So they're observing our conduct, they're learning from us, and hopefully we're doing all we can to ground them with the morals and values so that they'll not only make good decisions, but pick the right peer group. So that's just a little thing I want to say. Not little, that's kind of major. Any thoughts on that, Anika, so far? Well, I mean, I get that, Mark, but I'm also thinking about jerks that I may currently work with or have worked with. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're not going to mention names, are you? Names. Remember, names. Anika works at a college. She's <laughs> getting really close to home. And past jerks. And past jerks. Okay, there we go. Over your tracks. The reason why I'm bringing them up is because I learned that the reason why they were acting like jerks is because their boss mm-hmm. act like jerks. So it kind of mm-hmm. trickled from the top down. So I feel like this question is more from the, is the college like supporting the jerk mentality? Because that's, we just want you to feel pompous or whatever. And I say that because I remember them, at least one specific, I remember her 
unjerking. Like she became pleasant after a while. <laughs> can and, I put unjerking in the urban dictionary? Yes, you can. Unjerking. And, <laughs> unjerking. But let me I'm, I'm I'm come but, up with but Mark. I'm gonna come up with a new word called <laughs> anikisms. Anikisms. That's an anikism. Listen, Mark, unjerking. Listen, listen. Okay. But the reason why she unjerked is because she changed bosses. Like there was mm-hmm. a new person that came in that wasn't a jerk. And so that impacted that person in a way was like, okay, well, I guess I shouldn't be a jerk anymore because my boss isn't. So I'm, j- I'm just saying that because I felt like it's more of the influence on what is supported, I guess. I don't know. No, I think it's a fantastic point. And I was going to transition to something extremely similar. When I talked about roots and wings and modeling and all that, that was just like foundational stuff. Right, of course. You know, or talking about what we can do at home. What right. you're talking about, which is extremely important, and that is something anybody knows who's ever been in any organization, which is Influence. organizations take on the personality yeah. of their leadership, yes. right? Like you can see it in a church. I'll, you know, look at the personality of a pastor right. or a priest, and that's what you see in the congregation. And so one of the things you want to look at is what is the leadership like? Right. And the leadership is not just something like the president and the chancellor and the provost. You know, leaderships are things like who's leading the dorms, you know, right. who's leading your departments. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which leadership, anybody you're interfacing with a lot. So there's a lot of different leaders on a college campus. So that's definitely something you can look at. Now, I will say this. Every college is going to have great professors, bad professors, great clubs, bad clubs, great courses, bad courses, great dorms, bad dorms, great study abroad, bad study abroad, great activities, on and on and on. And it's also going to have positive people and negative people. Right. You know, it really is. and those of you who have emailed me know I have a quote at the bottom of my emails and it says your attitude, not your aptitude will determine your altitude. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another quote that I like to share. And I, you know, when I used to teach, I used to say this at least twice a month to my students. And I used to say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, you know, or another Mm -hmm. way of putting it is, Show me the five closest people in your life and I'll show you, you know, who you'll be over the next five years. That's who you're becoming. And so one of the things that's extremely important is what peer group you are in, where you choose to associate. And that could be a fraternity. That could be a sorority. That could be a certain dorm, Mm -hmm. you know, because dorms can take on personalities. And so but let's look at this from a question of an applicant going in. How do you find that stuff out? Right. And there's different ways you can find out. One of the best ways is to just start talking to students over and over and over, talking about different dorms, talk about different clubs, talk about fraternities, talk about the culture of the school. You know, obviously, you know, I'm big on reading school newspapers. I'm big on reading alumni magazines. I'm big on talking to lots of alumni. You know, interview a bunch of people and find out the personality of the school, the personality of the dorms, the personality of the clubs, the fraternities we're already seen. I mean, these are just some of the things you can do to safeguard. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect, but those are some of the things that you can safeguard. So, I mean, the reality is there are no guarantees, right? But I think these are just the things you can do to learn how cultures differ from school to school, from dorm to dorm, fraternity to fraternity, sorority to sorority, you know, department to department. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you can learn so that you can best position your child to be in an environment that is most conducive to them not turning out like a jerk or being around jerks. Right. But I want to share something and true story. This actually happened to me twice. And so I'll focus more on one of the incidents, but they're very similar. So two students I worked with, Anika, last couple of years, great kids. They both went off to, you know, highly selective colleges. Okay. And in one case, I'm going to focus on the most. I was communicating, keeping in touch with the student after she got, I'm not mentioning the colleges and I'm not mentioning what states these kids are from. I'm just, you know, this is not a positive story. So I just want to be extremely ambiguous intentionally. So I was keeping in touch with both students actually, but I'm going to focus more on one of the stories and everything was positive. And then I followed up with the mom to see how things were going. And then she said, Mark, you know that my daughter's not at that school anymore. I said, what? So to make a long story short, the daughter had gotten involved with the wrong guy and was really making some very, 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 very imprudent decisions, extremely. And so it got to the point, you know, because the daughter is like, look, I'm 20, whatever, back off. I'm an adult. Don't tell me. You know what I mean? All that's going right. Mm-hmm. So 
what happened was the parents said, we're not going to let you run over the cliff. We love you too much to do that. So guess what? We're not paying anymore. And so, you know, of course, that was like, that didn't go over really well at first. And, and so the student was like, fine, I'll pay myself. I'll figure out how to do this on my own. I'll go, I'll get scout. Well, she found out how hard it was to pay. These are private schools that are very expensive, both cases. And so basically the student had to come home. And now the student is so grateful for the mom for that, making that tough love decision. Hmm. And I had another situation almost identical. And the reason I'm sharing the story is because worst case scenario, if it's really drastic as a parent, if you believe your child is not in an environment that is conducive to them going in the right direction, you do control the power of the purse. Right. Now, that's not something to be used lightly because you don't like the major they're picked or something. Right. But it's just the last ditch effort. And I'll tell you what, in both of these two instances, everybody would agree now that that was a very, very good decision that the parents made, even that they were very hard decisions to make. Hmm. Any thoughts on that, Anika? Well, you said they were adverse outcomes. I thought those were great outcomes. Like, you know. Well, they... well, what I mean is they were extremely difficult situations. I mean, these All are right. cases where kids are involved with both cases with a guy that is not having positive influence at all. Hmm. You know, mm-hmm. in one case, it was actually in both cases, there was abuse mm. involved. And, yeah. you know, one case was drugs and one case was abuse. So it's not good situations. OK, and and I'm only throwing this out because worst case scenario, if it's not working out as a parent, you don't have to leave your child in that situation. Hmm. That's all I'm just saying. I mean, I don't want to feel like we're spiraling down in a, into negativity here, but I'm just mm-hmm. trying to keep it real. Right. And I, and I also want to and I also I'm not trying to advocate for an over controlling parent to you know, threaten their child if they don't do everything the way they want. And I've seen that happen as well. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't, that could, this can be abused if it's taken to an extreme. Hmm. And I don't want that. I'm not trying to imply that. Yeah. Any final thoughts? No, I mean, I can see all of that. And just going back to her initial question about, you know, mm-hmm. how do I know my, if my child's not going to be a jerk? I mean, you can be a jerk and still be doing great things. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you can be a jerk and not be yeah. in abusive relationships and not be in certain, you know, whatever. You can still do well and be a jerk, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and the focus of her question is how can I pick an environment that will help decrease the chances that my kid turns out to be a jerk? Right, right. And so then we're just talking about factors that you can use to assess an environment. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is do look at the mission statement and do look at the core values of the school. Like, that can make a difference. Like, it's not everything. I mean, I'd rather have the people, the right people, than the right thing on some creed. Right. But I also do find that some schools that have a real strong core value set, there can be a correlation with how that fleshes itself out in the culture of the school as well. Mm, Okay. Thank you, Kirby. (laughs) Sorry that Anika thinks you're Mr. Kirby. (laughs) Stop, Mark. (laughs) She's going to meet you someday and be like, Anika, you called me a man. I mean, it's, I mean Kirby Puckett. It's an honest mistake, I'm just saying. I know. I thought, when you said that, I thought about Kirby Puckett. He was a baseball player in Minnesota a long time ago. Okay, I did not think of him, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know I knew that. This non-sports person over there. Okay, old But, but don't ask me about an art. Don't ask me about an art display, because I don't know any of that stuff either. Thank you. Anika, it's so great to have you back. <laughs> and back, back in your old self with all your spunkiness. Uh, well, you know, it's it's an upper and a downer, but it's all good. Hey, take care of your mom. And we, you know, we're going to be supporting you every step of the way. And hopefully, friends, you like our new format because this is our first episode kicking off our new format. It's going to be fantastic. Okay, friends, hopefully you heard part one and part two of my interview with Mark Kantrowitz. Today is part three. And in this part, we talk about how do you actually appeal an aid award? What do you say and who do you address your appeal to? Mark answers these questions and others with some detail. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. So, Mark, let's talk about the how people appeal. And I think we've covered 
quite a bit of ground in terms of what different categories that can make for a good appeal and not a good appeal. Let's go back to one that you, you know, mentioned early on, which is a change in income, uh, especially with prior, prior year. So, you know, for example, students that are applying for the 2021 class, you know, starting class, they'll be using 2019 tax income from the parents. But if you're not living off 2019 income anymore, so if the income went down in 2020 or even 21, that could be a basis for an appeal. So how does somebody uh, appeal? Is this going to the financial aid office? Is it going to the admission office? Is it over the phone? Is it in in writing by mail, by email? Just walk us through sort of the nuts and bolts of of the mechanics of how somebody would appeal. Okay, so need-based aid is handled by the financial aid office. Merit aid, especially academic scholarships, is usually through the admissions office or the office of the president. So let's first start with uh, a merit uh, aid appeal, which is easier to deal with. Let's say the scholar, the college has an academic scholarship that requires you to have at least a particular GPA and a particular set of test scores. And let's assume that you missed that cut. But after you sent in your application for admission, your grades improved, or you retook the SAT and your SAT scores improved. And now you would make the cut, except it's a little bit too late. Well, you contact the admissions office after they admit you, and you say, hey, I, uh, I'm now satisfying this, these criteria. Can I get that merit? academic scholarship. And sometimes uh, that kind of an appeal will work because their goal is to admit students who have a certain level of talent. And if you've demonstrated that you meet those criteria, they may be willing to give you that money, especially if it's right before the decision day. Now, with an appeal based on financial need, first thing you should do is call the college financial aid office and ask them, how do you submit an appeal? In most cases, the colleges will say, write us a letter. In some cases, they will have a form that you can download from their financial aid office webpage that solicits information about the most common special circumstances. Because they're, what they're going to want to do is not just evaluate you on that particular circumstance, but rather they do a holistic review of your financial circumstances. So if you had a job loss, but you also won the Mega Millions jackpot, that they're going to consider both factors when evaluating your ability to pay. Now, when you write that letter, first of all, keep it short. Don't tell your entire life story. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, focus on the factors that affect your ability to pay. Start by saying that you're appealing for more aid, or some schools call it a professional judgment review or a special circumstances review. But identify that this letter is about an appeal and then summarize the special circumstances that affect your ability to pay. Maybe have a, a bulleted list with one bullet per special circumstance. Not only describe that circumstance, but state what the financial impact is on the family, such as you had a job loss, your income went down by this amount. And then make copies of documentation that support that special circumstance. So if you lost your job, copy of your layoff notice, a copy of uh, a letter from the unemployment office showing the recent receipt, typically within the last 90 days, of unemployment benefits, and attach the copies, not the originals, to that letter. Because the entire process is driven by documentation. The colleges are required by law to have a copy of documentation that supports their decision to make an adjustment. So if you don't provide that documentation, they're simply going to call you and say, can you send us that documentation? And then close the letter and thanking them for their consideration. Be polite because there's no appeal beyond the college financial aid administrator. And what they say is the final decision. Even the college president or the U.S. Department of Education can't override the decision of the financial aid administrator and and then send them the letter probably with some sort of proof of mailing or proof of receipt like uh 
delivery confirmation or a certified mail return receipt request and make sure it's going to an address where they can actually provide that in proof in confirmation of receipt. And then about a week after uh, the letter is received, call them, confirm that they received the letter. Sometimes things get misfiled and ask them, is there any other information they need? Because that gives them an opportunity to tell you, oh, we would like uh, an additional letter uh, relating to your dependency override request, or we have a question about some piece of documentation or some aspect of your special circumstance. And then uh, they will make a decision. Usually they make them pretty rapidly because they know that in most cases, the student is on a timeline. They're trying to decide which college to go to, and they may have to decide by May 1st the national candidate's uh, reply date, also known as decision day. But that also is worth emphasizing that you can appeal for more financial aid at any point in time. So let's say that you lose your job, your parent loses a job in the middle of the academic year. Right? You can apply, ask, appeal for more financial aid at that point in time because, and you couldn't do it before because you couldn't anticipate that uh, the employer was going to lay off uh, their staff. And if you know that there is an unusual or special circumstance before you apply for financial aid, before you file the FAFSA, you can send a letter in advance to the college to ask them to do that review and even before you get that financial aid award letter. So that maybe that award letter will reflect the results of that uh, professional judgment review. Most often it occurs after they get the award letter and they realize that they can't really afford the college based on that award letter. It's not just harsh, it's beyond harsh. And in that case, and they appeal at that time, but it can be at any time, even after you're already enrolled. There are three things you said there, Mark, that I want to underscore, blazing in bold, neon lights uh, that I have found are critical to winning appeals. One was when you said, find out what their policy is from the school, how they want you to do it. Because I find most of the ones I'm involved in are electronic. They want an electronic transmission now, whether it's uh, email or through the portal, but just allowing them to um, elucidate their policy and then following those instructions. And then the second thing you said that I find is critical is the documentation. You know, it's almost like the schools, they hear, talk is cheap, right? They kind of heard everything. And so like medical and dental bills, those are good appeals. Those are ones that I've been able to help a lot of students and successfully appeal, but they want to see those bills. They want to see proof of the bills, not just you estimating. And then the third thing you said, which is critical, is being polite and like not giving off any type of aura of entitlement, even thanking them already for their generosity and what they were able to do. That goes a long way because these are humans, not robots, and they can it can make a difference if they like you and they think you're respectful and appreciative for what they've already done. So I really appreciate you um, really drawing attention to those three things. Right. And it's also important to emphasize that in an appeal based on financial need, it doesn't matter how great your student is. So you, your student may have a perfect mm -hmm. I mean, 4.0 GPA or these days 5.0 on a 4.0 scale. I still have trouble understanding mm -hmm. why that's at all relevant. <laughs> um, perfect SAT scores, captain of the math team, captain of the baseball team. It doesn't matter. They're just focused on whether you can afford to go. Your credentials that you're trying to put in the letter to impress them, and that's why you got in. That isn't right. at all relevant to whether you're able to pay. And your mention of the um, medical care it reminded me that sometimes the colleges will evaluate or implement different special circumstances differently. Mm -hmm. So clearly, if your income has gone down, they'll make an adjustment to the data element on the FAFSA that relates to income. They might reduce it. If you are appealing based on the private K-12 tuition expenses of a sibling, some colleges won't make an adjustment. Some colleges will subtract the tuition that you paid from your income and some will actually cap the amount of private tuition that you paid at the cost to the local government for I mean, public school tuition, which is typically around 
$10,000, figuring that anything beyond that is discretionary in nature. Mm -hmm. And then with the medical expenses, the financial aid formula has built in something called an income protection allowance, uh, which is subtracted from your income. And 11% of that figure is supposed to be an allowance for medical care. Now, it's not 100% a reasonable figure, but it, it's the way the formula works. So many colleges, when they're evaluating medical and dental expenses, that first of all, it has to be unreimbursed, so it's not covered by insurance, they will subtract 11% of that income protection allowance from the amount of the medical expense before subtracting that from, say, income. Other colleges, though, have different methods. They, uh, some colleges say, well, it's got to be significant, and therefore I mean, they look at the standard for your tax returns where I mean, you can itemize uh, medical expense. It used to be 7.5%, now it's 10%. They'll set a, a threshold on your adjusted gross income, so it has to be in excess of that before they will make an adjustment. Because I mean, the colleges, they, they don't want to do a lot of nickel and diming they want uh, the special circumstances that are most significant. And in fact, when you write the letter, put the most significant special circumstance in terms of its financial impact first, because that will get them in a mode where they say, oh, your, your income went down by so many tens of thousands of dollars, they're going to uh, want to make, a, that'll set them in a mode where they're already thinking about making an adjustment, and then everything else is just icing on the cake. Also, these days, it's very common for families to say, well, the income that was reported in the FAFSA is higher than this year's income. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're filing the FAFSA for 2020-21, it's going to be based on 2018 income. The family will realize that their 2019 income is lower. You can't substitute 2019 income for 2018 but you can appeal. Uh -huh. And what will usually happen is they will not substitute 2019 income for the actual income reported on the FAFSA. Rather, one of two things that will occur. They might try to estimate your 2020 income so that if you had a job loss and then in the middle of 2019, you got a new job, and so your 2019 income is only partial year, they're going to look at your 2020 income and they'll base the adjustment on that because that will be a full year's worth of income. And they can actually pick any 12-month period that they want to use. The other case is if your income is volatile, it changes significantly from one year to the next. This is most often occurs with people who are self-employed, like taxi drivers or restaurant owners or people whose income is based on tips they'll realize that your 2018 income and your 2019 income may not be either of them completely reflective of your ability to pay. And so what they might do is ask you for three years or in some cases five years of your income tax returns so that they can see what your income has been over a longer period and they'll substitute an average to try to smooth out that volatility in your income. Yeah, and I find that your income has reduced appeal. It completely is going to vary from school to school, at least with profile schools. I've had schools like, well, Davidson and Emory told me that we're not making that adjustment. Emory told me, Mark, we would need 4.7% more money in our aid budget because guess what? Nobody ever comes to us when their income goes up. So that's a one-way street for us. But then uh, Grinnell and many other schools I could mention have I've worked with that have made that an adjustment. And so a lot of times, and are comfortable with it, and they've built that into their philosophy. So a lot of times these, you mentioned it before, Mark, the profile really, uh, it's really a, several hundred choices that those schools are making. And a lot of times each school comes up with its own philosophy as to whether they regard something as a legitimate reason for appeal or not. And you don't really know until you try. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and you can't get more money if you don't apply and then don't appeal. Mm -hmm. And so long as you're polite about it, the worst that can happen is they say no. Well, Mark, this is great. Let's talk about your unbelievable website. And I, I don't say that without any hyperbole. I love savingforcollege.com. Of course, I like the work you did when you were at Advisors and CapEx and FinAid and 
I've uh, kind of followed you for for several of the places you've been at. But one of the things I love about saving for college is your blog articles. Uh, talk about the blog. Talk about what's on there with 529. You know, I never told you this, but we have a recommended resource on every one of our podcasts. And we featured saving for college as our recommended resource. That was about a year and a half ago and we were just getting started. But tell us a little bit more about the website and how our listeners can best utilize it. Okay, so savingforcollege.com is the most popular website for 529 college savings plans and saving for college in general. We also have information about prepaid tuition plans and Coverdell education savings accounts. And we have a lot of tools that will help you identify the best way of saving for college for you. In addition, we have not just comprehensive information and advice and insights about 529 plans and other college savings vehicles. We also have a lot of content on other aspects of planning and paying for college, including the FAFSA, student loans, scholarships, education tax benefits. And we've been building out that content, and we now have I mean, hundreds of articles on those topics as well. So we're, we're trying to become more of a uh, one-stop shop with a complete set of information about all the tools that you can use to figure out how to pay for college. And in a way, we have a different perspective than a lot of the other websites. Because of our origins as a Saving for College site, we think about college savings as the antidote to student loan debt. So the student loans are there in case you didn't save enough. And so there's kind of this uh, balance between the two. And so you, you may see articles on our website about, for example, a student who graduated from college with very little or no debt because their parents saved enough, as opposed to stories about students who graduated with too much debt because they made some bad choices mm. and the parents didn't save anything. I mean, every dollar you save is a dollar less you're going to have to borrow. And so we, we try to encourage students to borrow as little as possible, not as much as they can, but we help them make smarter decisions about borrowing and repaying student loans smarter decisions about the trade-offs between the uh, tax-free status of a 529 plan distribution versus the American Opportunity Tax Credit, as well as how to find the best scholarships. I and mean, we, we give a lot of advice on these other topics. I mean, just today, I was looking at a really good article you had on there uh, about 529 money that saved in a grandparent's name, which, of course, is shows up as untaxed income on the student, which assessed at the 20% level versus 5.64% if it would have been in, in the student or parent's name. And you have an article up there about some options about what you can do if, in fact, there's money. And this is exactly a situation that I'm, I'm working with right now. And so I cannot recommend it enough. And, and the thing that I love is when you go to the blog and you do the search, it just really pulls up a robust search array of articles um, on there. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 109 is a website, and it's a website called yourfreecareertest.com. I love this website, and I use it all the time with my students. By simply answering 63 multiple choice questions, I find this test does an outstanding job of identifying potential careers that students will love. I use another website to see whether a student has an aptitude for the careers that appeal to them. But I love this test for sussing out interests. And the word free is in the URL because it is free. As soon as you complete it, you get a report that is emailed to you. By the way, yourfreecareertest.com is a good for students and for parents. So parents, check it out yourselves. It may end up charting you on a different career path. In addition to being free, I find it to be quite accurate. But another thing I love is that you can actually complete this entire test in like five minutes. The whole 63 questions in five minutes. So check out yourfreecareertest.com. We will now return to my interview with financial aid and scholarship maven, Mark Cantrell. 
What about calculators, uh, Mark? Do you have a lot of the loan calculators up there on the site? Which ones do you have? You now, we have uh, loan calculators and basic uh, standard repayment, extended repayment. We also have income-driven repayment. We also have a lot of calculators relating to saving for college, both modeling and where the college costs are going to be in the future, uh, how much you need to save per month to achieve a particular goal, as well as uh, detailed evaluations of differences between various state 529 plans and prepaid tuition plans and the like. I would like to correct a slight um, misstatement that you had. You were looking at the difference between grandparent-owned 529 plans and parent-owned 529 plans, as well as the difference between student assets and parent assets. So a student assets are assessed at a 20% rate, parent assets on a bracketed scale up to 5.64%. If a 529 plan is owned by a student, a dependent student, or that student's parent, it is reported on the FAFSA as though it were a parent asset, right? and that's at that 5.64% rate. If it's owned by the grandparent, it's not reported as an asset on the FAFSA, but distributions will count as untaxed income to the beneficiary, the student, right. and that will be at a 50% rate, not a 20% rate. Oh, oh okay. I, that's a great correction. Thank you for catching that. Yeah, that's good. That's a good catch. Appreciate you chiming in there. Talk to me about Cantrowitz.com. That's another website you have. What do you have up there? Well, and Cantrowitz.com is, is mainly a personal website, but uh, I have all my books listed there, including the most recent book, uh, which is already a bestseller, uh, which is uh, How to Appeal for More Financial Aid for College. So I have on the that page, uh, Cantrowitz.com slash book slash appeal. There's a link to a one-page handout that summarizes the basics of appealing for more financial aid. Plus, you can go over to Amazon.com and, and buy the book if you wish. You know, and I owe both you and our listeners an apology. So Mark and I met at the FSA conference. Was that November? That was November, right? November of 2018 in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And we had a, I had a great chance to talk to him about a number of these things. Of course, I was very excited to meet him, having read everything I could get my hands on over the years he'd written. And he agreed then to come on the podcast, but I knew he was writing this book. And in my mind, I said, you know what? I'll wait until he writes the book. And I'd mentioned it on our podcast. Hey, we're going to have Mark Kantrowitz on. And then uh, I reached back out and he's like, oh, Mark, I, I, <laughs> when did you publish that book? January? Yeah, it was late January. Yeah. So this interview should have probably happened about a year ago. So I, that's my fault. But a lot of the content we've talked about today is is in the book, right? I mean, I've got the book. I'm reading it. These are a lot of the things that are in there. Right. And it's a pretty heavy book. It's uh, and it's been called the textbook of appealing for uh, more financial aid because uh, it goes into a lot of detail and complete lists of uh, lots of examples of special circumstances, how things are analyzed by the school. So you get a, an appreciation for the perspective of the college financial aid administrator, as well as a lot of useful data that you can used to get a sense as to whether your aid package is typical for the school or not. Love it. Love it. Well, Mark, before we let you go, I always put every listener on the hot seat. This is our chance to get to know you beyond just Mark Kantrowicz, financial aid scholarship, maven guru, number one student in the country in math. It's a little lighter uh, side. So how do you relax? How do you enjoy yourself when you're not working? Well, I have a couple of hobbies. One is I show and breed uh, rare pedigreed cats. Cool. So right now I have a Cornish Rex cat. I used to breed the Peterbald cats, which is a hairless cat that uh, came out of St. Petersburg, Russia. Wow. And so I, and I still have one uh, Peterbald cat as a pet. You may have heard her meowing earlier in this interview. <laughs> and uh, my Cornish Rex cat is a quadruple grand champion. So she's doing quite well for herself. Wow. Other hobbies, I, I fold origami models. Hey, nice. Uh, and most people know how to do the crane or the water bomb, mm -hmm. uh, which are very relatively simple ones. I first learned how to do the more complicated ones. And for a while, I wasn't able to do the simple ones. Wow. So I would do um, ones that I, I like doing a lot are um, a Western dragon that has wings and it takes over a hundred folds to do one of them. I often will 
fold one of these models while I'm on an airplane and then give it to the flight attendants. They they really like that. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Well, when when I worked for a Japanese firm, uh-huh. I would fly to Japan a couple times a year and occasionally I would get upgraded to business or first class because of one of the origami models I had folded. Wow, that's nice. So was that just like a favor that the airline attendant did for you or, or was that uh you know, was that just like you the right person or how'd you get that perk? Right. So I was in line to check in and get my tickets for an international flight. And while waiting in the long line, uh, I was folding uh, one of these dragons. And when I reached the, uh, the, the agent, I set down the dragon and I didn't realize that they were interpreting it as my giving it to them. But, uh, and she said, how would you like to be upgraded to business class? And I said, sure. And could you do it for my boss too, who had just been the one ahead of me? She called him back, upgraded his ticket as well. I got a wow. lot of brownie points from that. I'm sure you did. <laughs> they, that you're you're putting what you're saying in action here. That never hurts to ask. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite TV show? If you ever watch TV, what do you like to watch? I watch TV often while exercising because mm-hmm. uh, it makes the exercise not be as noticeable. Yes, that's true. So I mean, I, I like science fiction. Mm-hmm. So and uh, one program that I really liked uh, was uh, the OA, mm-hmm. uh, which unfortunately Netflix canceled um, after the second season. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a little slow starting, but once it's started and you start getting into the real theme of it, mm-hmm. it was uh, kind of an addictive program. I, I really liked it. I thought it was thoughtful. And uh, a lot of other people are disappointed that Netflix uh, has dis- discontinued the program. Well, it happens. So if you had to switch careers and you couldn't do anything financial aid related, what career would you choose? Uh, mathematics or computer science. I mean, my undergraduate degrees are mathematics and philosophy. And the philosophy was really the program in language and mind, kind of an interdisciplinary degree in artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I mean, either of those, I, mean, I like inventing new things. I like developing new algorithms, Mm -hmm. Uh, and I still do that to some extent, but if I couldn't be involved in what I'm doing now, I would do that, or I'd pick something brand new and focus on it for a while. It takes probably five to 10,000 hours of work in a field before you become an expert in that field, and so whatever I do, I would try to do the best I can. And you succeed. I can attest to that. What's the hardest course you took at MIT? It was a graduate course in topology. Mm. And it uh, I was taking it freshman year, and I had gotten a little cocky. Um, first semester, I had taken five classes and done well. So the second semester, I took six classes and the graduate course in topology, and I didn't do as well as I should have. I don't even know what topology is. What's topology? <laughs> well, it's a kind of mathematics involving... Uh, the shape of things and interconnections. It's fairly abstract uh, form of mathematics. Mm. So you talk about things like the composition of a covering map is a covering map. And, but most people won't know what that means. Right. But you took this, this was a graduate course and you were just in your sophomore year. So it should be hard. Uh, it was actually my freshman year. Well, no wonder it was hard. <laughs> yeah. That was a little bit of a math prodigy. So yes. I mean, if I had, hadn't been overloaded, I probably would have done a lot better. But I know MIT uh, attracts math prodigies, right? I mean, did you meet many other people that you felt were like you at MIT yeah. in that regard? Yeah, I, I, I met a lot of people who were like me. And there were some areas where people were much more talented than I was. And uh, but in, in my particular areas, uh, I was quite talented and I had a lot of fun. And I worked on the student newspaper oh, okay. nice. for all four years, and I was involved in hacking, which uh, is uh, something unique to MIT, and these little stunts that uh, poke fun at the world. <laughs> so we get some great vacation ideas from our guests. What's your favorite place to go for vacation? I actually don't go on vacations. I and mean, growing really? up, our vacations were we would go to New York to visit the grandparents, and that was it. Uh, we never okay. went to on vacation to 
I mean, spend a week on the beach or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I, mean, I grew up in Massachusetts, so there was um, Walden Pond and Nantucket. So we would occasionally go to the beach, but not for an extended period of time. So what's your favorite place you've gone is it where you've been invited to speak and it brought you to a city or a country or something like that? Okay, so I'd say my favorite country is Australia. Okay. I've been there twice. Once uh, to present a paper at a computer science conference, and the other time uh, speaking about financial aid. And what really hooked me on uh, Australia was the Australian Aboriginal art. On the way to that computer science conference, I passed by an art gallery. And after I gave my paper, I kind of played hooky and went to that art gallery and other art galleries and spent most of the rest of the time I was in Australia just going through every painting in that art gallery and finding some that I really liked. And I took advantage of the difference in the exchange rates, which was I mean, very favorable to the U.S. dollar, and I bought a few. Mm. And over the years, I've collected more, and I now have a fairly big collection of Australian Aboriginal That's art. That's another hobby you have. You've got quite a few hobbies. This is interesting. So for our students who are listening, give them a pearl of wisdom or two. What advice do you have for them? Well, first thing is to apply to a variety of colleges. So not just all reach schools, but also some match schools and some safety schools, including a financial aid safety school, which is a college that you could attend, afford to attend, even if you got no financial aid. Don't try to pre-plan everything. I mean, it's good if you have a plan and a path to graduation, because that'll keep you on track so that you don't have to take five years to graduate or six years to graduate. But give an opportunity for serendipity to occur. Because yeah. sometimes you'll encounter something in college that you would have never planned on happening. And so it may be that you get exposed to a different field of study or a different topic entirely, and you may be very much interested in it. I mean, one class that I took in uh, undergrad was about astronomy, mm. and I took it because it was a requirement that I take one class from a list of uh, electives, mm -hmm. but I really enjoyed astronomy. I, I could have turned into an astronomer if uh, my path had gone a little bit differently. Mm. Interesting. And then... Uh, Borrow as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And just because you can borrow to the limit doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. And live like a student while you're in college so you don't have to live like a student after you graduate. So what's your advice on parent borrowing, Mark? What do you feel? I'm sure you've come up with a formula or policy, philosophy on maximum parent borrowing. What's your, I've seen some of what you've said a while ago on that. I don't know if you've changed your perspective or just, you know, like to hear what you have to say. Okay, so the first thing is if you find yourself needing to borrow parent or private loans, it may be a sign that you're overborrowing. Mm -hmm. But if the parents want to borrow to help the child pay for school and not as just another way of, oh, the child's going to pay back those loans because that will lead to the student having an unreasonable amount of debt, mm -hmm. the parents should have a rule of thumb that's similar to the rule of thumb for the student. Don't borrow more for all your children than your annual income. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, you should be able to repay the, those parent loans in 10 years because your income will be sufficient to do so. But if you're going to be retiring in less than 10 years, you should borrow proportionally less. So if you're going to retire in five years, you should borrow half as much. Here we go. And um, any advice for our parents besides that advice who are listening, just in general, because that's our number one audience by far is parents of high school students. And start saving for college immediately. Next week in the news, the rise of the mega university by Lee Gardner of the Chronicle of Higher Education. Our book chapter will look at the non-custodial parent profile. Our bonus content will discuss co-op programs. We will be in part four of the interview with financial expert Mark Kantrowitz, on the subject of how and when should you appeal for more money if your financial aid award doesn't meet your needs. And the college spotlight will go to the state of, Mark, you'll love this, Michigan. 
for the first time to look at Hillsdale College. Friends, as promised, it's time to talk about Rollins College. And Rollins College has a special place in my heart because for a while they were recruiting my daughter Joy for basketball. You know, I've been to college multiple times, but my last time was actually as as a dad with my dad hat on, trying to see whether or not it'd be a good match for my daughter to go and to attend. But a little more about Rollins. Rollins is it is located in Winter Park, Florida, which is an upscale suburb of Orlando. The average housing in, in the state of Florida is around two hundred twenty five thousand dollars for a home. When Winter Park, it's double that. It's for like four fifty. So it's a nice, quaint suburb with beautiful shops right outside the college. It reminds me of the Claremont College in that way. You can just walk and you know, these nice, beautiful restaurants. Everything really nice suburb. Really nice. It's fifteen to twenty minutes from da- from Orlando. 40 minutes from Disney, and it's an hour from the beach. And here's something I bet you didn't know, Dave. Did you know it is the oldest college in Florida? Well, I did because, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in Winter Park because I spent some time working in Florida. And we used to stay at Winter Park, and uh, Lauren and Frida would join me during the weekends, and we'd take the little tours on the lakes around Winter Park, and those tours would go right by Rollins College, and they would show the places where they water ski. <laughs> yes, I knew you. I knew you had you know had had spent some time at Winter Park. I did know Frida and Laura also were with you then. That's good stuff. And yeah, I didn't yeah. know that you knew it was the oldest college in Florida. So I thought I scooped you on that one. Good stuff. It was part of the little mini boot boat tour. And if you've ever gone to, go to Winter Park, it's really cool. It, it's a series of interconnected shallow lakes that are connected by these canals. And the houses actually back right up on the canals. So people who own these houses, quite expensive, have their own little boat dock so that they can actually go out with their boats and then go through the canals. And I think there's five interconnected lakes. And Rollins College sits exactly right on one of these lakes. So the best way to see Rollins College is actually not through the street side, but to take one of these boat rides and see it from the lakeside. <laughs> so. I would agree with that. I would agree with that 100%. You know, one of the nice things about Rollins College is it is located right on Lake Virginia. It's right on Lake Virginia. And the campus is stunning. It is a smaller campus, a tighter campus. It's a self-enclosed campus, 80 acres. It's got the Spanish Mediterranean architecture that you see in a lot of Southern California and even um, Northern California campuses as well, which I personally am a big fan of. But it was established in 1885 by New England Congregationalists. And it's a school with 2,000, a little more than 2,000 undergrads and a little more than 500 grad schools. But it's definitely an undergraduate focused institution. They only have five master's programs. Business is by far the, by far the strongest program. They're kind of known for their 3-2 MBA program where you can get an MBA in five years. That's their main master's program. But they also have some master's programs and things like HR, behavioral psychology, counseling. They are 60-40 female to male. And one of the things you're going to get at Rollins is intimate interaction with your classmates and with your professors. So their average class is 17, which is That's smaller than what a lot of people are coming from in high school. That's actually private high school size, right, Dave? 17? It it is. And that's their average size. And they have a policy of not having any classes over 25. Yeah. It's a very small, intimate liberals college. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you want personal, individual attention, I mean, and to really know your professors, Rollins is fantastic for that. 62% of students live on campus at the school. Before I get into some more admission stuff, Dave, anything else you want to share? Well, if you happen to be like my good friend, Mark, a complete weather weenie, this <laughs> is the college for you. What I really liked about Rollins College is that it has close to perfect weather. Uh, yeah. It's a little inland, so it doesn't get so much the force of the September hurricanes and that craziness that goes down a lot in Southern Florida, you're somewhat protected from that. The temperatures can dip down into the 40s and 50s for a couple weeks in December or January. But for the most part, you know, you're talking about from September to June, the temperature ranges that'll be between 50 and 
75 to 80 degrees. It's San Diego weather. It's very, very nice. And then, of course, you're right in the heart of, of Florida. You're a stone's throw away from Universal. You're a stone's throw away from Disney World. <laughs> so it's nice. It really is nice. And while it's true that Florida can be a hot and humid place, one of the things that the Florida colleges do, which I think is pretty smart, is they do end their school year earlier. They start earlier and they end earlier. And so, you know, the South Florida schools are ending in April and all the Florida schools end pretty early, actually. So right when you start to, you start to feel that humidity and that heat, it's time to go home. And so it's a very, very popular school in with Northeasterners. No question about it. Like when I was doing college counseling in boarding school in Pennsylvania, I mean, Rollins is, a, it's, you know, a lot of the Florida schools, whether it's in Miami, Tampa, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, Florida schools are just very, very popular with Northeasterners who vacation there and are ready to bounce and be out of that cold, inclement weather. Well, got me down to Georgia. So I can relate. <laughs> you can relate. One of the things we have now is that when you're starting to pay college tuition, it really impacts your ability to go on those nice spring va- <laughs> vacations. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> so yeah, draw <laughs> syndromes, remembering your... Your winter park days there, Dave, as we talk about this? Well, you know, in my mind, when Lauren was doing her list, I was like, man, if she goes to California, and I don't have to pay for spring break. We could just come visit her. But now she's stuck in Connecticut, and so much for that. (laughs) Hey, well, you know what? It it worked out great because we all know this, but Dave actually works in Connecticut quite a bit, so he gets to see his daughter quite a bit, as he mentioned in a past episode. He's licensed in 12 states as a traveling doc, and he strategically planned it to be in Connecticut. So good for you, my friend. It was good. <laughs> so back to Rollins, 62% of students live on campus. Um, the acceptance rate is 67%. So two out of every three students get in who apply. Uh, grad rate, 68.3%. Four-year grad rate, 63.5%. Five-year grad rate. Meet the median student, you know, I kind of don't like to do medians because it's just the public thinks those are cutoffs. But this time I'm going to do it just so you know, half the people have under this, half have higher. Median student is a 3.3 GPA, a 27 ACT or 1280 SAT. But I'll try in the future not to do medians, but just, you know, half have under, half have above. The cost of attendance is a tad under $70,000. Uh, once again, you're getting, you're paying for the average class size of 17 and that access to the professors. Obviously, the more people in a class, the more they can spread that tuition over more students and they can bring the tuition costs down. But one thing that is good is every student is automatically considered for a merit scholarship without having to submit an additional application. And those merit scholarships range between ten and $30,000. So you can automatically just take 30000 off if you're a high achiever. And that's not all the scholarships. They also have eight to 10 full cost of attendance scholarships. And now now you guys know that's tuition, room and board, all expenses. There are eight to 10 of them. And for those, there are not automatic scholarships. There's going to be a very competitive process for those that are uh, going to involve a multiple essays. And those essays are going to be extremely important if you're looking at competing for one of those really, really large scholarships. Uh, they have a great honors program and about 30 kids every year selected into the honors program. That's also a very selective process. They are going to look holistically. They're going to look beyond test scores and grades. They're going to look a lot at your extracurriculars. That's very important in their admission process. Uh, they require one recommendation from a counselor, but they will also consider teacher recommendations if you submit them as part of the evaluation. They will recalculate your GPA based on strictly an academic GPA. And by now, our regular listeners know that's math, science, English, history slash social studies and foreign language. And so they're not going to count your band or your art class or your PE class in their GPA. They don't have a lot of need-based financial aid. So if you're somebody who is, let's say, a Pell Grant recipient, which 39% of the country are, and your income is on the lower side, then don't expect to receive, they're going to gap you, in other words. You know, you can maybe get the ten to $30,000 off the automatic merit aid, the rest of it's going to be federal money, so it's going to be some quite a bit of loans in there uh, for you, unless you're able to get one of those, uh, you know, those big eight to ten cost of attendance scholarships. And so, likely, if you're, you're kind of student fan, they could pay thirty to forty thousand. You're going to have a probably much better chance affording Rollins than if you're 
a family that can pay in like five to fifteen thousand dollars, unless you get one of their huge scholarships. In general, the student body is definitely on the wealthier side. Um, the student body also tends to be a little bit more on the conservative side. Fifty percent of the students come from Florida, and most of the others are coming from the Northeast. Although they do attract, you know, a lot of states and a lot of countries as well. But the majority outside of Florida do come from the Mid Atlantic region, nor- Northern Virginia, all the way up through Massachusetts. Rollins puts a huge emphasis on community service. So they have a community engagement project that all students are required to do and they have community engagement courses for credit. So for example, they'll have courses like adults with autism and you go into the community and work with adults with autism for credit, which I think is really, really cool. And another thing they're known for is study abroad. They put a huge emphasis on study abroad. It's not uncommon for over 75% of their kids in any given year to go abroad. Last year, that number was 77%, which just, that's staggering that basically eight out of 10 kids are going abroad, which I think is great. They put a big emphasis on on becoming proficient in another language in their curriculum. And I would say their classes are challenging, but not overwhelming. They have a really good work-life balance. They are known for their palatial dorms. So, you know, if you want really fine living on the dormitory side, uh, they can compete with the best of them with their dorms. And um, I've eaten in their dining room and I'd say their food's pretty good as well. Uh, Another thing they're known for is their foundations program. And these are a series of five linked seminars that give you exposure to different interdisciplinary topics. So you can pick between like cultural collisions and enduring questions, environments, identities, and innovation, and take a series of courses that are along those theme with multiple different disciplines, which is fantastic. And they also have a lot of creative courses in their curriculum as well. Things like science of chocolate, science of superheroes. So a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation in their curriculum. You don't actually pick your major until the end of your sophomore year. And this is something they do. I really like, you actually have to take a couple courses within your major before you can declare your major, which I think is a great idea. Because a lot of people think, oh, I think I want to be a, you name it, fill in the blank major, right? Whatever it is, economics. And then you take two courses and you're like, I do not want to be an economics major. So I think that's a a pretty cool idea. They are test optional, but this is something we've talked about before. They're test optional. But if you want to get larger merit scholarships, you know, those automatic scholarships I talked about, those are based on test scores and GPA. And so they'll give some merit scholarships for a test optional student, but the largest your your merit scholarship can be if you apply test optional is 15,000, where you can get up to 30,000 if your test scores are high. So once again, you want to invest in getting great test scores and having a good GPA because those two things for almost every school are going to be the biggest factors in their admissions process. Of course, test optional schools are going to put more emphasis on your curriculum and essays and things like that if you apply as a test optional student. As far as some of their strongest majors, uh, biology is definitely strong, chemistry strong, biochemist strong, and then with their location, marine biology is very strong, psychology, political science, and business. And they do do some cool things for their broadcasting students. The broadcasting students, they get to have their, because there's a radio station on campus, so they get to have their either their own show, their own radio show, or they get to have their own podcast or they get to do music and be a DJ for the radio station. So I think that's pretty cool. And lastly, I'll I'll come a little bit on the racial diversity, 65% white, 19.6% Latino or Hispanic, 4.2% black, 3.5% Asian, 0.2% Native American, and 2.8% didn't declare. Any thoughts, questions on Rollins, Dave? Well, you know, I, I do know Rollins quite well, and it's a beautiful college, no doubt about it. The only concern I have with Rollins, it, it is known to be quite an expensive institution. And uh, when you look at that sticker price of seventy grand, and comparing it to some of the other colleges we've talked about, like UNC Asheville, which I think thirty grand, you're all in. And even what I was shocked about when you talked about London Metropolitan, which I seemed was half that. So my question is, um, how generous are Rollins? college for closing that gap. You'd all you'd mentioned before that it's more advantageous if you can afford thirty thousand in the gap as opposed to five or ten thousand. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so right away, let's look at those automatic scholarships. So the, what the Rollins is doing, they're doing what a lot of schools do. They're working off of the high tuition, high tuition discount model, right? And so yeah. basically what that means is that stronger students, they'll incentivize them by giving them up to 30000 right off the top. And if you're a weaker student and you just squeak in, then you're going to be paying full freighting. You're helping subsidize those merit scholarships that go to the top students. And once again, when I say cost of attendance, remember that's not just tuition, room, and board. Everybody, I'm counting your entertainment on the weekend, I'm counting personal expenses, I'm counting transportation, books, student expenses, everything. So your direct costs to the institution themselves, you know, are going to be noticeably lower. So it is all in costs. And so, yeah, so basically, if you're going to be a higher GPA, higher test score type kid, then now, you know, we could be looking at, um, you know, under $40,000 for a real small, you know, personalized experience. But you're right, Dave, it's tough to compete just off money with the public liberal arts colleges. Right. uh, Because they're also giving you smaller experience and they're subsidized by those state dollars, which drives their costs down. What you'll get with a, a private school versus a public school is more of a national student body, and you will get more of a wealthier population. And for some people, they'll say, you know what, the connections I made, the parents who I made, the kids who I met, whose dads were CEO of this, that, the other, it was worth me paying up to be with the wealthier student body. That's case by case, but that would be one of the benefits that some people would say they would get when you go to a, a school that has a wealthier population. Well, I could see that. I could see that. But you know, once again, I'm a value added man. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, your value added man is dropping 80 grand at Yale. <laughs> uh, who's, who's currently just looking at a Tesla <laughs> through a computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, Dave's not always been this Tesla fanatic. Okay. This is like a fad of his. that has been like, Kicked up in the last two months. Like, <laughs> I talked to him all the time. He never even said the word Tesla in 2019. But ever since 2020, he's got the Tesla bug. Ever since you went to that <laughs> showroom and you bought out, your wife liked it a lot, too. I said, well, would you write a Lexus or a Tesla? She said, I'd take the Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but Dave, listen, it's really kind of great when you can <laughs> chime in. You know, you've been able to chime in on, on Asheville because right. you were there. Yeah. And chime in on Rollins and and. I think just your travels and getting around, you know, you've actually been to some of these schools and it's nice having you uh, give your perspective and not just have it be me when we do these call spotlights. So, so thanks well, for your input, my friend. Well, I got to tell you, this is how you've affected me because uh, just being so vicariously involved in your podcast and your colleges, it's like whenever I enter a new town, almost automatically I'm thinking, is there a campus nearby? <laughs> there we go. Is, is there? Is there? I mean, I, I was I literally. I was. I was working at in Poughkeepsie. I was look, working at Uniontown Hospital, and I'm like, hmm, what's yeah, you did. You got over to Vassar then. I it remember. Vassar, and I remember. So I, I will go to a college campus, uh, find out where the library is, park the car, and just walk along because it's it's a beautiful walk in the park. Some people like to do the golf. Mark and I. Well, he likes golf. But I like to just walk along college campuses. <laughs> well, I like that too. I'm big into just setting foot on college campuses, and I just like even people watching and trying to figure out the culture. Like, right. what's the culture like really here? And and uh, I like to park my seat on a bench and talk to yeah. students too when they come by. And who's this scary man talking to all these students? But you know, I'm, you're definitely catching the bug if you're doing that, Dave. <laughs> and I, w- I will say one thing about Rollins College: when you go and visit it. Winter Park is like one of the richest suburbs of Orlando. And the lake area is literally where all the really rich multimillionaires at the turn of the century that lived in New York would come and build their homes and their their second cottages and so forth. And so when you travel around, you see Rollins College, but all around are these huge mega mansions. In fact, I know that when Horace Grant played with the Orlando uh, magic. He built this huge house <laughs> on the other side of the lake. So when you take these lakeside tours, you're actually looking at all these mansions and they talk about the history of the mansion and the industrialist who built this mansion for his wife. And then you round the corner and it says, and there's Rollins College. <laughs> so, yeah, those so are really a, fun. You know, I've done those yeah. with my kids all the time when we go to yeah. Florida, especially South Florida. We do those tours where they go out in the boat and they, you know, they describe all those. I mean, those are fun things to do with your family. 
But you know, the average yeah. home there is 450,000. So they have the really, you know, the seven figure properties, but they do have uh, properties that are, are not there, but definitely it's a totally an upscale suburb. It's beautiful. It's really quaint. Um, yeah. Check it out the next time you're in Disney or Orlando or in Central Florida. Yeah, and they have this very quaint downtown strip with this town square. And if you like go that. during Christmas, they actually have it all set up in, in winter lights and so forth. And it really does become like a winter park. You could see why it's a winter resort town. So it's a they very, need to hire you nice for park. tourism, man. You're selling hey, man. it hard, dude. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, well, I tend to stay in, a, in Kissimmee over there. I got a timeshare in Kissimmee and just get over there and just visit Winter Park and go right on back to Kissimmee. Well, I, I thought a shout out to all you weather weedies out there. <laughs> Rollins College is definitely on your list. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show. You can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.